Divine Truth Spirit Experiences Discussion Experiences of people who have lived on Earth and who have now passed into the spirit world. The title of the first part of this personal experience from spirits is Stuart discovers the benefits of a relationship with God, during which Mary channels Stuart, a behavioral scientist who has been studying Jesus since Jesus was eight years old, who talked with Jesus three times previously and now shares his own experiences of his relationship with God and the differences between progression in natural love and receiving God's love. This session was recorded on the 11th of July, 2018, from 11 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Good everyone. Mary and I are just taking a break from our busy schedule this week. It's a fairly busy schedule this week. So uh, just to do a little bit of channeling, because there's some spirits who, you know, come around us frequently and want to talk to us. We frequently take some breaks in and out of our life to do that. So and what we decided to do is to film this one. So hopefully uh, you enjoy it. We don't really know at this stage what the discussion's about. Mary's just getting herself ready for the channeling. So once she does that, we will get started. Hello, friend. G'day, Stuart. How are you? <laughs> yeah. I'm very pleased to come back and have a discussion with you. All right, as I am too. Yeah, it's good to see you or hear you again, should we say? Yeah. Uh, many things have changed since we last spoke. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. 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 So where are you now? Are you still in the third sphere or? No. no, no. I believe that I'm in seventh sphere. Oh, wow. So just, there you go. Just entering. Yeah. Uh, it's been a lot of emotional processing work. <laughs> it's probably fairer to say that I'm at the top of the fifth and yeah. I glimpsed the seventh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel there's so many lessons and so many things that I've learned. And I feel quite the changed person. Yeah. Uh, Don't feel very inclined studying us anymore, I, I bet. <laughs> that is exactly what I, I, I <laughs> was saying to your wife this morning. <laughs> there has been far too many other things and, and to be honest, things that I found magnificent beyond, almost beyond my comprehension and yeah. and this has taken my focus and yeah. I suppose I simply wanted to come and and share something of what I have learned. Yeah and perhaps uh, for the sake of our listeners and I know um, in the past you haven't liked me doing this much but just for the sake of our listeners obviously when we first met you you're in the second sphere Yes. And and very intellectually dominated by your life. Yes. And also, uh, if you you know examining our life, Mary and my life on Earth, quite in in a quite a, a detailed, methodical, but meticulous, intellectual, yes. meticulous intellectual manner. Yes. Um, which of course uh, didn't really have much of a personal impact upon your life. The examination process, I mean. It was no, only the discussion that had the, the first the f few discussions we had that had the impact, wasn't it? No, mm. I, w I felt I was quite comfortable <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> viewing, viewing the, um, the subject yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, from under the microscope, from my vantage point as the, the disengaged scientist. Yes, as studying the, the frogs in the glass bowl. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> almost exactly as I pictured, yes. Uh, perhaps didn't think of you as frogs. No, but, <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> uh, but yes, I felt very uh, comfortable and I was very driven to attain knowledge and our early discussions assisted me a lot to understand why that was mm. or, or, mm. or perhaps to confront why I was so driven in that way. Yeah, yeah. And I, I feel so such a changed man. There's so much more emotion in me yeah. <laughs> now, and and in the past I found that to be such a 
a shameful thing. <laughs> and, yeah. And yeah. now I feel all my life on earth and then f for, for all the years since my passing, I really, I really was trying to, to measure up or, or really surpass my father and, mm. and... So really it was a competition with your father in a way. Yes, mm. yes. Maybe, and, can we, um, before you proceed with your personal experience, can we just talk a little about the emotions of, uh, that many men on earth have, in particular, and also many scientists have as well. This is this group of emotions relating to the fact that there, there is a sort of almost a denigration of emotion that occurs in the scientific community on earth. And, uh, and, and if we can maybe talk about that for a bit and also talk about how that's influenced your ability to discover new scientific things and, and then compare that perhaps with you know, your past, you know, just the last few months and how, how that's in, the emotions have enhanced your ability to, to discover scientific things. Could we Certainly. make that comparison? Uh, I'll for, give it a true? shot. Yeah, I'll yeah. give it a shot. Okay. Um, I, coming from the family that I did, I felt quite attracted to science mm. because I felt it promised me um, the ability to uh, uh, almost conquer knowledge or, or, or to, to um, build a mighty brain and to, to have a sense of, uh, well, really arrogance or superiority, which I understand now is largely over my father, mm. um, but over others mm -hmm. because I knew so much. Yes. And as you say, in scientific circles, the mind is seen as the mightiest tool and the thing to perfect. And emotion is seen very often as unquantifiable, mm -hmm. <laughs> unable to be measured and discerned accurately. And therefore it's the enemy of reason. Yeah, like it's viewed as a major impediment, isn't it, to, to scientific process or to progress? Yes, mm. yes. Uh, or something, I suppose my feeling was that it, I didn't trust it. Yep. It's something to be not trusted. Mm -hmm. And um, on reflection, I can see a lot of fear that I had uh, in relation to emotion, almost not even my own emotion, but just emotion <laughs> in general. And mm -hmm. I feel many of my colleagues shared that fear. Mm. And so, but at the time, you didn't feel it was fear, did you? No, 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 I didn't. So what, what did you sort of see it as at the time? It was, the, it, it, could we say that it was like an intellectual reasoning that emotion was superfluous to the points of discussion that you wanted to, or the points of interest that you had? Is that how you saw it or? Um, well, largely I didn't consider emotion very much. Yeah, yeah. I saw it as a weak kind of, or, or a, well, it just wasn't science to me. So it was more of a weakness to engage emotion? Uh, or, or well, yes, yeah, certainly I had that feeling, yeah. but I'm trying to reflect upon... How you've, yeah, what I'm trying to sort of get is the feeling you had before you realised what feelings you had. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, uh, hard. Like, it's very it's hard, hard and I'm finding that challenging <laughs> yeah. because of where I am now, yeah. where I, completely I opposite. have so much awareness yeah. and so much clarity about my life experience mm. uh, up until the point when we first spoke. Mm. So let me consider... <laughs> And what it was, I, I was dismissive yes. <laughs> of emotion. Yes. Um, and really I honoured or I, I looked up to and I aspired towards myself the steely intellect, the intellect that could master and understand things. And so emotions and emotional people and discussion of emotion almost seemed wasteful to me. Yes. Because it wasn't meeting my overall goal, which I can now see 
was very emotional. <laughs> well, it was but emotionally driven. Emotionally driven, But yes. not emotional where, as you In, were feeling it sort of thing. No, I wasn't mm. feeling emotion. Mm. I was feeling that. <laughs> well, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, now we're getting into discussion of what you now know. <laughs> which I, I is was, understandable. <laughs> yes, I was driven. I was driven and I was dismissive towards emotion. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's difficult. I think I'm finding it difficult to describe because I didn't really think much about it. Yes. I didn't think about emotion. I didn't consider emotion at all. I dismissed it and I didn't really have any attitude except that. But, uh, and again, it's difficult because now I understand what was, was driving in that yeah. state. Yeah. Uh, so if we think, if we're just talking about my level of awareness before we spoke mm -hmm. first, um, Even though you were observing a person who was dealing with emotion, which is interesting in itself. Yes, isn't it? and I can see now, <laughs> in retrospect, that I was quite drawn to that. Yeah. Um, because I had such a strong uh, judgment and fear of emotion, mm -hmm. and I came from such. Uh, an emotionally suppressed environment. Mm. Uh, I and I think if you remember in our first discussion uh, that we spoke about the fact that I I was almost fascinated by the fact that you were attempting to achieve something that I thought could only be achieved through my methodology, mm. but you were doing it with such a vastly different methodology, mm. and uh, it's. So um, it's not fair to say that I was utterly judgmental of you being emotional. That's not, again, it's because I was so disconnected from my own emotional condition mm. that I wasn't really aware of what, what I, mm. I almost feel like I was a robot, <laughs> not a robot, but a, a, um, Can we call it like a dispassionate observer? Because that's what it felt like to me when you were observing me, like it well, just sort of a. If if we say dispassionate in the sense of emotionless, yes, yes, yes. But I was quite you were intellectually curious. Yeah, exactly. But but, <laughs> um, but there wasn't much. It's it's a difficult state mm, to, describe. to describe, and and I do see now, and I do understand that many people on Earth, just not just many of my colleagues, are. Uh, who I had when on Earth, uh, and who are still scientists now, um, even uh, many of them share that uh, situation internally yes. with regards to the mighty mind. I call it <laughs> the desire for the mighty mind, <laughs> as opposed to the emotional state. Yeah. But but I, again, this is upon reflection. I can see that in my work life, I did have fellow scientists who were more emotionally connected, mm. but it's almost as if I didn't see that aspect of them mm. and in their direction and their drive. Mm. Um, they obviously were experiencing more emotionally and had less judgment and fear of emotion, mm. but it's almost as if I had a filter. <laughs> I had a filter in the way that I interacted with my scientific um, occupation, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was to filter out anything that was emotional in content. Mm. So it's almost as if those colleagues, which I can now see, were more emotionally connected than myself and more... Uh, it's a strange uh, adjective, perhaps, but juicy. They were <laughs> not dry. They were more juicy um, in in their approach to life and yeah. their profession. Yeah. But I had my filter on, and so I only saw them as I saw myself mm. and interacted with their minds. So, in summary, then, it would probably be more accurate to to say that when it came to emotion, you were pretty much as much as possible in denial of it rather than so mm. sort of just a la general lack of awareness of it even being important.
Yes. Yeah. So, and while I'm calling it judgment, it wasn't a judgment that was um, hateful or severe. It yeah. was just that it wasn't. What's the point of having that? There's no, no, point, no point to the discussion or to the points of observation. Mm, mm. It, I didn't place value on it. Mm, mm. Mm. Did you, uh, just to, uh, as an interest, uh, when you're on earth and when you're in your spirit world, uh, life up to the second sphere, did you ever fall in love or, or any of those kind of things? Mm, no. I, I mean, I had companionship with women mm -hmm. and I was married, mm -hmm. but and I, <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot say that I was in love. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting too, isn't it? Mm. How... Um, I do feel a lot of people on earth sort of live a life of companionship or friendship with people and have even sexual relationships with people, but it's not, they're not, their heart isn't touched by it, I suppose is the best way of saying it. Yes. And, and it's interesting that, that that's the case uh, for, for most too, I feel. Mm. Yeah. I, I almost feel now as if my heart didn't beat <laughs> yeah yeah i understand i feel now that i have a beating heart yeah it's yeah. very some of the comments in the bible are quite interesting aren't they the one about turning mm. a heart of stone into a heart of flesh mm. you know that that's you know that's really the contrast isn't it between the two states it is and but it's fascinating to because i wasn't um completely divorced from religion in my upbringing mm. i mean mm. and and so I, I knew something of things but i approached in my in my viewpoint of religious faith in general uh, i still saw the mind as the mightiest thing mm. and the mm. way to uh, so in even in that verse the heart of stone to the heart of flesh while i could intellectually analyze that that was a, a a metaphor and an analogy mm -hmm. i really inside of myself thought of stone and the science of of a of a human body mm -hmm. um yeah. if that makes it's di yeah, difficult you to didn't describe. even apply it to a passionate a, a change in the passionate no. part of the person i may mm. have been able to have a rational discussion <laughs> with you that <laughs> that highlighted that point yeah. but yeah. but really in my heart i just saw that um well, I suppose in a way, if there was any magic to existence and a creator, it was in the workings of the purely physical uh, body. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw that as an immense creation and, mm. and a wonderful thing. Mm. And the fact that your heart beats is, is quite incredible. Mm. And uh, it... it uh, the mind itself is is a marvelous uh, invention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and yeah. I saw the the physicality and the intellectual uh, capacity of human beings as something well uh, marvelous and remarkable. Yeah. It's partly what drew me to, to study that, you to that study mm. yeah and uh, like uh, yeah I, I would have to agree with you too with uh, the human body definitely one of the pinnacles of the creations of god in the physical realm for sure and and if you examine even the spirit body as you would have also had opportunity more opportunity now to do mm -hmm. that also is the same in the spirit world isn't yes. it it's, it's definitely the most complex creation of all and and mm. i found that marvelous yeah. <laughs> passing into this spirit realm and seeing that there was this other body mm. and and i was fascinated by that also mm. so now we come to the time we had our discussion a few a few discussions we have now but right back at the very first discussion the the one where you were fairly resistive to the discussion and then and then the second discussion where we you know where you're more open you realize some things and more open we've talked about that already but, uh, and so now, uh, sort of, and, and for the first time, you started to connect to emotion, started to connect to the possibility of the investigation regarding God. Mm. And, and I think this is the second thing I'd like to talk to you about, is the investigation regarding God. Mm. Well, how did you proceed with your investigation regarding God now, uh, after you, we had that conversation? 
It's been immensely challenging and rewarding. Mm -hmm. You know, when we had our uh, discussion about investigating, yes, you know, and and that was the sort of the second, I think it was the second conversation we had about investigating the possibility of God as a scientific truth. Yes. Um, Obviously, uh, you can see now what I was trying to do there is appeal to your desire for scientific truth. Yes. And also uh, in terms of investigating something that you had previously been pretty much in uh, suppression about or denial about. Um, so so after that discussion, so we're talking now, Car Carsey, you mind back to the second discussion where we talked about that. Um, Obviously, you must have engaged from that point on some processes that, and this is what I'm sort of interested in sharing with our listeners, I suppose, as to what processes you're now engaged to, okay. to actually investigate. No, not, not what you've found, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to break it down into steps, if you like. <laughs> um, I see, I yeah. see your purpose now. Yeah. I, I suppose I feel so full of enthusiasm and wonder for what I have found. I just want everyone to know that. We'll get to that in a minute, okay. we will. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. So I suppose that to be most accurate, mm -hmm. uh, I would have to say there was internal processes that I engaged mm -hmm. and external processes that I engaged. Okay, so let's look at the internals first. Well, really, based on our discussion there was a change in terms of my feelings of inquiry about the matter yes uh, so i began to and can ask i say that, from a can i say the feeling you had then was that i felt from you once you realized you could make the investigation mm -hmm. there was a real strong feeling of enthusiasm in you at that point that i felt from you Yes. Uh, and, and that's obviously what drove the next stage. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, I have to say my enthusiasm has waxed and waned yeah. uh, based upon, um, well, as you can imagine, perhaps, uh, based on various issues that I had to encounter regarding my earthly father. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so y you assisted me with the initial recognition that... Um, that that was a problem yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i did uh, you're correct I, I felt this enlivened sense of enthusiasm mm -hmm. to now begin to find out more mm -hmm. uh, but there was fears that came up in me as well mm. um, having that first connection with god was incredibly uh well faith building i mm -hmm. suppose mm -hmm. um and faith, again, was something that I saw as emotional. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore indeterminate. Indeterminate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned immediately that faith was a very, well, quantifiable thing and, and had substance. Yes, yeah. And that really has kept me going. So I suppose that's a good example of the fact that um, the internal process was my own inquiry. But in that case, the external process was my discussion with you. At this, I, I have had many discussions with many spirits mm -hmm. since, mm -hmm. and I've asked many questions mm. uh, about, about this process, how does one go about it, mm -hmm. and also what they have learned mm -hmm. in their adventures. Mm. Uh, I've also made the time to cease my inquiry about external matters mm -hmm. uh, and focus instead on my own existence, if that makes sense. It certainly it does, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. it, whereas prior, I was very engaged in the analysis of existence in a clinical sense, mm -hmm. uh, as in not relating to myself mm. uh, or not do you understand my meaning? Yes, I do. So, yeah. uh, you, you could say that um, you, 
in a lot of ways you were studying where you were studying things like even things like what consciousness is and what mm -hmm. and what motivates people and what how how what impacts the motivations that people have and so forth without without really studying the the soul based functions mm -hmm. that cause a lot of those things to exist yeah. Yes, and and also there was no application towards myself. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, so it was I all was... external interest, mm -hmm. but no personal like change as and, a result. And and now I, at times I wonder because I was quite uh, interested in human behaviour mm -hmm. and s to some to some degree or to to a large degree human psychology, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I really had the. The filter on about emotion <laughs> and even not so much interest in your own psychology and nature <laughs> that's right that's right yeah. and i do see that in many of my colleagues yes yeah um yeah. and so yes uh where was i up to uh yes so i had a sense of studying existence mm -hmm. um as a general uh phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, how people exist and what drives them in in their behavior and so forth uh, and also then I had particular interests in terms of individuals and their existence, such mm -hmm. as yourselves, mm -hmm. particularly yourself. But on Earth, there was other case studies and different things that I was using really to analyse in order to gain, um, to add to a pool of knowledge and data about generalised existence mm -hmm. for everyone. Yes. Yep. And so... During this time, uh, this I have shifted from having a process that was engaged in the analysis of of a collective, <laughs> and really started to focus on my own experience and my own ex existence. Yes. yes, and I can see how lacking that has been in my life before that point. Mm almost that I had been driven uh, and so interested in the analysis of the collective existence because my, uh, the, the feelings of my own experience were so remote from me. Mm. It, it's, it's so almost it's almost like I you were driven to the collective analysis in order to avoid the personal analysis. <laughs> It's, it's a strange uh, interplay, it, almost yeah. to avoid my uh, experience, yeah. most certainly. But I see now that there was an underlying feeling of uh, mystery about my own existence that I was in some strange intellectual way trying to resolve. Yes, yeah. 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 Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have been drawn to that that particular field a scientific field i agree yeah mm. i agree mm. and, and I, I suppose that's something that a lot of people on earth don't really understand very much and that is that often we are drawn to a certain profession because of certain emotions within us that drive us to that profession mm -hmm. or certain fears within us that drive mm -hmm. us to that profession so mm -hmm. and i feel most people on earth probably don't get to understand that until after they've passed and lived uh, usually a significant time after mm. they've passed in the spirit world. Yes, and it's 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 interesting, isn't it, that in my old life, if we can call it that, I would have studied the um, the various factors that cause people to choose certain professions, but I would never have so in terms of their upbringing and their environment mm. and even their certain behaviours or preferences within their personality. Mm -hmm. But I never would have uh, conceptualised it in the way that I do now, which is uh, the way that you just expressed it, about personal emotional experience that people are either wishing to engage or avoid mm. and that being the prime motivator in mm. in people mm. and so it, i suppose i'm explaining this a little because i know it must seem odd to people that i studied all of my life humans and their behavior and yet i was so <laughs> yes. remiss for or, or, or with with without consideration of emotion hmm. and I, I suppose i want to say that 
because you asked earlier about my attitudes towards emotion mm. in my in my mm. professional life i i suppose i want to say that i really didn't understand the truth of emotion i may have been e able to talk about uh emotion but i didn't i didn't understand it as it really is mm. and so those other factors like environment and family even you know an absent father or or a mother who is a certain way or mm. i could analyze those things and i see that they are evidence now mm. of emotion mm. but at the time i didn't i didn't make that correlation mm. It, in any real sense, mm. uh, I, I saw that we must analyse the factors and not the emotional causes. Mm. I didn't really conceptualise that there were emotional causes. I thought emotions were something erratic and unreliable in terms of analysis. And I also thought there were certain things that governed a person, such as personality, mm. uh, that were set Mm -hmm. Set. I knew changes could occur in terms of people's behaviour, mm -hmm. but I thought that that was completely driven by the mind, uh, and I were and the intellect, the brain, and I could work with people. Uh, or, or, I didn't work with people, but I could. I could see methodologies mm -hmm. and and theorise about methodologies that could change the the behavior of a certain person mm -hmm. um, but i really didn't have this sense of emotion it wasn't until um our second or third discussion i can't quite remember where i started to get a sense of emotion being almost like the mystery ingredient that i had never even thought was missing from the recipe <laughs> yeah. and and I saw um, through, again, through my own experience, I had to, I had to analyse myself. And perhaps this is um, something that you did want to speak about. I had to analyse myself and, and to experience myself emotionally in order to really understand the science that I'd been engaged in for so many years. Mm. Yeah, that's, to truthfully engage yes, with it, no, to, to, to I find that as sort of amazing engaged. in a way because it's sort of like unless you are able to go through emotional experiences and understand them, emotions do remain a mystery. Mm -hmm. and, and I think for most scient scientific processes on earth and even people in the medical profession and even people who are psychologists and, and, and um, psychiatrists, often see emotions as a mystery and, mm. and therefore not able to ever be resolved. Mm. So if a person is like a sexual sadist or some mm. other quite severe, has some other quite severe psychiatric or psychotic illness, mm. and there's a, it's sort of looked upon as if it's incurable, you know, you've, you've just got to restrict them and you control them in some way. But Manage uh, the behaviour. Manage the behaviour, yeah. Certainly, there's the belief that there are certain uh, conditions or manifestations in a person that are really set and I suppose that's I believe that because I had studied so many people and there was not a change exactly because uh, when you and this is the trouble with observation isn't it um, when we're observing an imperfect state we then think that's the actual state that's mm. on, that, and, and the only state possible mm. and, uh, and I find that's interesting on earth too because you know, we, we look at how, you know, how creation interacts with people, you mm -hmm. know, so other God's other creations interact with hu human creation. And, and we often believe it's just normal mm -hmm. when, when in reality we don't really see everything going on because we haven't yet had that emotional connection to everything mm -hmm. that's happening. Mm -hmm. So I find the whole way that we analyse everything on earth is quite like, it's, it's very short-sighted. Short it's probably the best way of putting mm. it. It's, it's, well, it, it's I, without sight of really what's going on. Yes, mm. uh, yeah, mm. I would call it incomplete. Mm. Incomplete is perhaps the biggest thing that I think about in terms of the analysis that I undertook. Mm. Uh, it mm. was clear at times there were anomalies, that there was dysfunction, that mm. there was problems within individuals and collective groups. 
but I, my analysis was not complete because I didn't, it, what I now know, I didn't, to, and to put it very simply, I didn't understand the existence of the, the soul mm, um, yeah, and, yeah. and all of the flow on implications yes. that that has. Yeah. And, and God and the governance of this <laughs> and just everything. Uh, there's really. a lot of remarkable things <laughs> yes. in there as when it start, you start talking about the soul itself. Mm. So, so, so now we've come to the point perhaps that we need to just ask about, okay, what, what um, in your, so getting back to the investigation period now mm -hmm. of the scientific investigation of God, what, what, what simply did you do to investigate the possibility that God existed? Well, I began the inquiry uh, emotionally mm -hmm. and I began to, well, really, um, Ask to know uh, about God's existence in a personal way. So mm. in the way that I knew you existed, or that I know you exist, through some kind of personal... Manifestation of something, of some inter interaction. interaction. Yes, so mm. not just, I suppose I'm saying not just as a purely... I've stopped trying to gather external evidence and not that I'd even been engaged in gathering external evidence for God, yeah. <laughs> but I suppose, and that's not strictly true because I did gather external evidence, but uh, eventually, but um, it's really relying solely on external evidence. Yes. And yes. I began to desire to have a personal uh, interaction. So per you could say the the beginnings of a personal relationship sort of thing mm. is, is the where you started mm. your experiments. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and I think perhaps, mm. I think perhaps that opened me immediately to my conscience a lot more. Mm. Uh, and that assisted me then to, to, and then I had many helpers, mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, many of whom who had similar backgrounds when on earth, mm -hmm. either professionally or personally, mm -hmm. or both, um, assisting me with how I could begin to, to really maintain a state of longing and prayer mm -hmm. uh, and what what personal things that I needed to do in order to maintain that state mm. because once I had some initial experiences of receiving um, well I know that you you often talk about receiving love from God but mm -hmm. to me it really felt like just having a, a, an interaction yeah. a personal interaction yeah yeah. Um, where you communicating or receiving communication in return or where, whether it's feeling and then feeling feelings in return. Yes, mm. inherently it is very loving, mm. <laughs> but mm. there was so much more occurring for me than just receiving a loving feeling. Yes. I was suddenly engaged in an awareness that God existed mm -hmm. and I was fascinated, mm. fascinated had so many sort of questions that weren't even formed within me mm. uh, that I was receiving answers to, if mm. that makes sense, mm. about God's character and nature, about my own character and nature, mm. and about God's desires for me and for other people, about the truth of sin, I suppose you, you would call it, mm -hmm. what was right and what was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but all of that was given with, it was uh, imbued, I suppose you would say, with love. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that information and all of that exchange. And uh, mm. it, it's such a, it almost feels cheap to describe it. Well, that, that, I know that it's a, it's a difficult thing to describe your own personal relationship with God mm. um, because it is a personal relationship mm. and it's unique to you. Now, obviously, feelings are going to be similar to other people who have the same, have a relationship with God, but mm. um, it is a unique experience, isn't it? Because God treats all of 
his children uniquely. So, you know, you can't. And I, I, feel, I feel, though, that when we talk about love on earth and receiving God's love, most people do sort of see it as a sort of just this experience where all of a sudden you feel like you're loved. And it's, <laughs> and it's nowhere near like that simple. <laughs> it, oh, no. it, it, as you can imagine with an infinite being, Obviously, there's a lot of complex things that goes on in a relationship with an infinite being. Mm -hmm. And and many of those things, are uh, obviously, all of those things are to your personal welfare and benefit. Mm. But also very, it's a very emotional process, isn't it, too, of like even, even the emotional process of understanding that there's certain questions you've had ever since your childhood even mm. that you couldn't really formulate and put into words, but that God already knows what the proper words are mm. and even when god says those words to you it's like that's exactly <laughs> you know it's like and and the beauty of understanding that god knows your feelings better than you do mm. is, is an interesting mm. is an interesting part of the relationship it, it yeah. is it is and the the feeling that god knows me and my personality so intimately mm -hmm. and loves that personality mm and nature to me that um th and i suppose that's the other thing that i should explain is that in that process that feeling uh of about god's feelings about my personality i found immensely confronting mm. uh so did you find raised things a lot of grief in me mm. about the fact that my own earthly father uh, was Didn't did not have those feelings and about your nature, and it helped me <clears throat> to understand almost almost in a moment my entire existence into that up until that point mm -hmm. what had been driving me, mm -hmm. and almost the emptiness of what had been driving me, because I was. I was striving for this feeling that I was receiving from God, except I couldn't ever have imagined how complete that feeling from God was. I, I mean, I was I was chasing a skerrick of that feeling uh, from my own father mm. uh, or men around me in mm. place of my father or mm. the world around me in place of that feeling from my father. So... Mm. Uh, um, to understand that that had driven almost every action mm. I'd ever taken. Uh, and perhaps I'm not, well, no, that's how it felt. And it's probably true. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it, like it does feel to me that the substitution process that goes on where people deny, you know, this relationship with God, but now have to, you can never really get a complete substitution from any other source for that relationship with God. And that, and that, of course, is how God's created it to be. Mm. And, and it makes sense that it's mm. going to be that way. But Well, and it's, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. Well, um, I didn't know, I, I just suppose it was love that I wanted, some form mm. of love and acceptance of myself. And, and so I didn't even know that this thing with God would be possible. And I didn't even feel, uh, to me, it would have been satisfying to have just uh, just one person, even honor <laughs> my my person, your true nature. Yes, mm. and but uh, but really, by the time I was ten, I was so removed, really, from even the knowledge that that's what was happening, and there were mm. so many aspects of who I was and uh, my personality that were already dormant within mm. me because i felt yeah. i had to replace those things with other things yes this uh, whole substitution that the parents put us through of substituting with their desires for your own nature and mm. um, ends up in a very dissatisfying state doesn't it and mm. and um, unfortunately not only do you end up quite detuned from your own nature but you also uh, have also this underlying deep longing that somebody recognizes your nature at some point and uh, and often that drives it uh, turns into big quite quite big addictions mm. uh, as a result too yes mm. and and even if i was my person I, I sort of felt that my personality I could only use the aspects of my personality that I felt would gain me recognition mm. because really I wanted, and again, I didn't understand, you know, I felt that recognition was love. Mm. 
Mm. I felt I never had any recognition mm. from my father and I felt if I could gain recognition from from men around me and, and men in the world, then uh, I could, uh, well, I understand now, I could avoid the grief. I mean, I never, mm. I never had any kind of analysis. Concept of that, yeah. Um, and now I understand love is so much more than recognition. Mm. And, and, and it's why it feels so... inadequate to try and describe it really in mm. words mm. Uh, yeah i, I do I struggle uh, even you know when we're trying to discuss it with people it's still a bit of a struggle trying to put it and sometimes the best thing you can do is use illustrations from their life or whatever to just try to describe it but it is difficult one, once you've gone through the process to then go backwards and go how do i then compare the two mm. places you know that's that, that's right and it, it's almost as if you know that i can see now that there's conditions within a soul of every individual that that are driving their motivations mm. and very often um there's a sense of wanting the uh, what the individual would call love <laughs> but having received now this perfect love i see that what's driving them is is not that the thing they're looking for they can't even imagine no, no. and so I, I understand i understand your difficulty because it's difficult to to say to a person even longing for god's love or or, or receiving love uh, that person really doesn't even know what love is is, is or yet. means or or, or any of those feels things, yeah. like or how complete it is or mm. how it's nothing like um anything that i experienced uh up until that point mm. and it's certainly i had no even rational intellectual concept uh of and so yes it's mm. it's yeah it's difficult I thank you very much for your assistance and and i note that you didn't you actually pointed me towards pain <laughs> the pain that was already in me mm. rather than trying to entice me with with love if or that's how it feels now yeah no and, and it is true to a degree because my feelings are while the pain exists within a person obviously there are, there are great distortions about what they imagine love to be mm. so when you start talking about love they're imagining something completely different than what you know is available and so sometimes what you've got to do is help a person remove the barriers to it mm. first and the barrier is all about the pain of course so and this is where it's sometimes difficult right at the beginning isn't it because you've got these barriers of pain that prevent you from allowing love to enter mm. or even desiring love to enter. And yet uh, the desiring of love to enter is the thing that causes the major change. And mm. so, yeah, so, so I, find, I do find it difficult at times because it's sort of like I can see in some ways uh, God sort of lures us with the concepts of love, mm -hmm. if you like, but, but unfortunately for most people on earth in particular, uh, and for many people in the spirit world who have not yet really experienced love, you know, obviously our concept of love is quite distorted. And so when, when we see the lure, it's almost not, not attractive to us. Mm. Uh, and mm. and it's, like, it's like a fish, you know, someone's fishing and they put on a lure on their fishing hook and throw it in the sea. You know, to a normal fish, that would be attractive. But, <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, to, some, some, you know, to, to people who are detuned emotionally and in pain, that's now not attractive anymore. And so it never, it, it, the lure of love, yeah. actually we don't even value as, a, as an important thing. Yes, and for myself, there was certainly no lure of a relationship with a parent. Yes. I, yeah. I can see I was driven for this recognition yeah. from men, but the thought of uh, a father, yeah. <laughs> you know, a father in heaven, yeah. uh, that it's almost was, revolting rather than yes. attractive. Yeah. I thought, well, that's double pain. Mm. <laughs> I didn't think it, I should say, but yeah. that was my that's the feeling that, yeah. response. I understand yeah. that I was having yeah. now. I can feel that I was having now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. All right. So, so now um, I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm yours to listen about yeah. your, your, the, what you've now discovered. The, uh, I just wanted to have that discussion about the other things because mm. I feel it's good for people on earth to sort of connect with sometimes with their, you know, there, there is a strong feelings of dissatisfaction in earth life generally. Mm. And, and people often don't connect to what that dissatisfaction is even all about. But most of the time, if you think about it, it's because no one, no other person is really capable of fully understanding you. And, mm. and obviously your soulmate has a capa capability of doing that at some point. But, but initially, when you begin this process with God, you come to realize quite rapidly that God fully understands you. Mm. And, and there is uh, something immensely satisfying in that, that, mm. <laughs> that, that there is one being in the universe. Of, of course, it makes sense logically because he created you, obviously he's mm. going to understand you, but, mm. but that's not what you think at the time. Mm. And, and, and coming to, to an awareness of that emotionally is quite a powerful, powerful thing, isn't it? On the, it is. on the person. Mm. It is. Yeah, but all right, let's look at the things you've now discovered. Shall we, that, that you'd like to share with people who well, are listening? Well, I, I feel we've discussed some of it. Mm -hmm. I suppose all of my life on Earth, I measured my myself against my achievements, mm. against what I had attained in terms of knowledge and what kind of recognition I received from, from the world. Uh, and I saw that as a measure of my worth. Mm. Uh, I saw that as a measure of my... value, but also a measure of my success. Mm. And what I know now is that God measures... God measures everything, but at this point in my progress, I feel that the measure that God is most interested in within myself is the, the willingness to love. Mm. And that has been such a powerful lesson for myself that in part I wanted to convey that to your listeners, mm. that that is the truest measure there is of a person is their willingness to love and mm. um and i i feel that and in a way that is such a freeing thing to know <laughs> yes because it sort of relieves a person of the endless endless uh, drive for knowledge doesn't it in it a does. lot of ways <laughs> it does and the irony is that i feel that that my endless drive and many of us <laughs> when we spoke earlier about people who are seemingly unchangeable and yeah. it's very accepted that certain people are a certain way and it's uh it's a drive that cannot be changed mm. um i can see that my endless drive for all of the intellectual knowledge and the rationalization and the the publication and, and all of those things that I strove for when I was on earth, they were not only so tiring and taxing, but they, that drive, the things that I did under the influence of that drive were some of the most damaging things I did and some of the most that they they demonstrate a lack of willingness to love i suppose mm, uh, mm. they they were opposing mm. this will in me mm. for love and and that is perhaps some of the challenges that i've had since we last spoke i mean that lesson to me is magnificent mm. <laughs> uh but i've had to let go of certain things and i've faced challenges in in receiving that Mm. truth emotionally from God. I mean, I feel that God presented that truth to me emotionally and I withdrew somewhat, mm -hmm. not only because there was a sense immediately of the emptiness of how my life had been, mm -hmm. but I, I could feel in me the, the desire to keep measuring my worth in the way that I had. And, mm. and there was a multitude of reasons for that. Mm. 
some of them originated in my childhood. Uh, well, most of them originated in my childhood, but I suppose I saw how much I had fueled the, that uh, kind of damaged perception within myself and built upon it. It's almost as if I built a city on the sand. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, I built <clears throat> upon it. I'd taken so many actions and I'd done so many things and I'd attributed to myself praise and and not in a conscious way again but i i'd invested and and each each step i took that gained me recognition and i didn't receive uh what an you abundance would, of it. call <laughs> an abundance of, of worldly recognition when mm. i was on earth but mm. it, you know just in my day-to-day -day interactions and the power that i felt i had through knowledge and mm. and the different things that i did uh i I, I almost positively reinforced to myself uh, and I the the fact that the way I was heading was the right way to head and mm. and I I I think the best way to say it is I praised myself or I gave I had a good feeling for myself that I felt was valid mm. in that process and so when it came to shifting all of that it was like the rug was pulled from under me hmm. and suddenly i had to face that i had built this city of my own um significance that was actually hard for me to to let go of yes i, I sort of feel um when the irony there's an irony to it in a way isn't there because when we our first discussion one of the reasons why you took offence with what I was saying is because you felt that I was saying that your life was invalid. Mm. And the irony now is that you realise that a, a lot of your life was built like a ha house of cards on sand. Mm. <laughs> you know what mm. I mean? Like something you could easily wash away or blow away. Mm. And, and the irony is that many of us construct a life like that on earth, don't we? Where, where we're trying to gain our worth or acceptance or, or other emotions through the life we construct only to find out the whole lot of it was pointless and we've mm -hmm. really got to go through it's not a complete start again because in that process often we do discover things about ourselves but but often we have to go right it's all built on sand i've just got to <laughs> basically build it on a different foundation mm -hmm. now of, of reality and 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 i feel it, it, the offense that was taken at the beginning of our conversation when we started was a lot about the fact that that you felt I was really saying that your yeah, life was worthless up to the <laughs> up to a point, and um, yes, and and yet now the irony of that is that when you look at your life back then, while it was not worthless, you could see that compared to the life you're now in, in, enjoying, uh, it's significantly different in value, isn't it? Yeah, I, mm. I, yes, I feel that there's a sort of um, it's it's almost as if up until the point of our first discussion, uh, which was very significant in my entire life, mm, mm. <laughs> I feel quite emotional about that. Mm. But up until the point of our first discussion, I see now that I was a slave to my own damaged belief systems mm. and that those damaged belief systems had caused me uh, to build this city mm. on the sand. And it, I say city on purpose, it was more than a house. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was an intricate set of responses and behaviours and decision-making processes. It's a labyrinth of, constru of intellectual yes. construction, isn't it? Yes, or, and emotional. And, and emotional. Uh, because, it's just um, a labyrinth, like there's walls yes. and doors and everywhere where they shouldn't be and <laughs> you know, they're leading you to other places where they shouldn't go. And, yeah, so and and mm. I felt it was quite uh, decorative and pleasant looking because <laughs> I suppose I'm trying to kind of describe the the righteousness I felt I had about mm. my viewpoints. And then when I succeeded in that, what I saw was a righteous uh, mm -hmm. endeavor, mm -hmm. I I felt I was doing all the better, and I could be more proud of myself and. And so this is how it becomes this almost in my perception at that time. Uh, again, I'm speaking figuratively, not literally, but a, a, a as if it was a beautiful city mm. that I could be proud of. Mm -hmm. And um, and you you absolutely correct that in our first discussion there was a strong confrontation that I wasn't willing to engage. Mm -hmm. 
But now I see that in that endeavour of the city building, mm -hmm. I was quite a slave. I was a slave. Mm. I, there was all those things I felt I had to do and aspects of myself I had to um, express and others suppress and, uh, and then new ones that I felt I had to manufacture in order to build and sustain such a city. Mm. And I do feel compassionate towards people who, who are no longer children. They're living their life for decades mm. on earth and then in the spirit world building such a city because... Mm. Even though one is a slave to that existence, there is so much that personally goes in to, I believe we all want to, you know, we want to be not troubled. <laughs> we want to feel in some way that we're doing what is righteous uh, or righteous is the wrong word because sometimes we're willing we're, we're quite happy to do the wrong thing in order <laughs> in the building of the city but exactly we want to feel that what we are doing has value and is important and is good for us yes it's good for us is yeah. perhaps the best way to say it so we want to feel that and then when we do the things that we feel are good for us and it works we 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 say, good, I've done a good thing. I'll mm. do some more of that. And, mm. and so even though I was a slave and now I feel immensely free, mm. I feel immensely free and I feel that um, the way that God measures my worth is, I mean, God believes I have worth mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, no matter what. But then also that God is just personally interested in this one thing that I have total control over and that I can do, <laughs> which is to develop love. Mm. Um, that is it, it, it's so liberating. Mm. However, <laughs> that there's a space in between. And I know that I'm still going to face challenges. Mm. Um, in giving up aspects of the city, you know, because mm. it's not just that there there was pain at the inception of the beliefs that drove the city building. Mm -hmm. There's also the the investment I generated throughout my life, and then the um, the pain that I created through the city building. Mm. And there's also the letting go of the 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 feeling and it is emotionally mm -hmm. letting go of the feeling that what I was doing was good for me mm -hmm. that has perhaps been some of the hardest challenges I've faced in my relationship with God and in mm -hmm. my my progress which I feel has been uh, you know relatively rapid since we last spoke mm -hmm. it's been, been good um, but that that feel that giving up there's a grief there's a grief mm -hmm. And, and I haven't always been soft to that grief. Mm. And I haven't always sought out the, the, the internal processes where I can confront my, my, um, the lies I told myself, the, the, the error. Mm. Uh, and, I, and at times I've run away from God and the others who might help me confront that error because there was a grief in me and a fear in me about giving up everything that I thought was good about how I should live my life. Mm, yeah. No, it is, a, it is a very sort of confronting process, isn't it, in a mm. lot of ways. Were, th were there things that um, you found out about yourself that you... you uh, well, I suppose what, I, what I'll say first is that usually there's two things we find out about ourselves, isn't there? There's, the things that we find out about ourselves that are actually good, but we thought were bad. Yes. <laughs> and then there's the things that we find out about ourselves that are actually unloving from God's perspective and therefore quite evil in their, in, in their outcomes, mm. but we, that we think are good. <laughs> yes. So, so yeah. I just spoke about them a lot, yeah, didn't yeah, I? Yeah. But yes, they're, they're, and I smile because I knew what you were going to say. Mm. Um, it's such a... It's such a great process, and I mean that in the sense of it being wonderful, but also in so great in the sense of it being wonderful, but great in the sense of also it being immense, grand, <laughs> yeah, immense. grand. <laughs> yeah, it, it's such a great process because 
I've come to find that uh, that 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 lo love I've felt that love for that boy who was chasing butterflies on the riverbank mm -hmm. and to feel that um, that that was a pure expression a, a wonderful expression of who I was at that time mm -hmm. when I felt I've lived such a long time feeling that and my spontaneity and my delight, <laughs> the, the feeling of delight, mm. that that was somehow wrong. Mm. Uh, that is still emotional for me now. Mm. Uh, to, to, so there's still feelings coming out of me of the grief of what that was, you know, and the joy to find that there's yeah. parts of my nature that that are so um, in harmony with love. Yeah. It's so sad, isn't it, how uh, parents generally, because of their own sadness and their own insecurities and their own emotional suppression, choose to suppress that sort of childlike delight. So mm. f for most of us, by the time we're in our teens or even, uh, and sometimes even younger, um, we've basically done a lot of suppression of those same delights ourselves yeah mm. yeah yeah it's a it's a, certainly an interesting process so you um, I, I, go, on, go on so what you were going to say uh well i suppose that 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 spontaneity and the childlike part of me and the delight and the the aptitude for emotion that i really had back then that mm -hmm. i didn't that completely self un without consciousness of myself um but also i see there or i i know there now that there was the seeds of the man that i became was not devoid of my nature no. uh, that 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 inquiring <laughs> that inquiry <laughs> um and even the the desire to 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 scientifically know and understand a thing that was there i wanted to to understand the butterfly and mm. see it and mm. and and understand the differences and the intricacies and and all of that i see was present in my life i mm. just i was so remote from it in terms of a true soul expression yeah mm. and you can see can't you that you know and and you know the whole the whole thing that happens during our childhood and our formative years with regard to our relationship with our parents and society yes how much of an impact it has on detuning us to the point where the only things that are really left within us that we recognize are the things that everyone else will also allow yes. us to recognize. And that, that's a very sad yeah. uh, fact. And the beauty with the relationship with God is God recognizes everything. Mm. <laughs> and so, you know, yeah. that, that, you know, that obviously is going to have a huge impact on our lives if we have that relationship. Yeah. yeah. And um, I was just wondering, uh, just uh, a, few, t a couple more questions. One, one was related to relationships, how they've changed since you've changed. Yes, Qu well, <laughs> quite a lot. And I know you want to ask about my soulmate. I always want to ask about soulmate, <laughs> you know that. But, <laughs> but if I can speak in general. general yeah, in general relationships first, yeah. that would be good, yeah. Um, well, I feel for the first time in my existence, I'm having relationships with people. Yeah. 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 So I can see now that without emotional content from within myself and, and a sensitivity to the emotions of another, mm -hmm. there's really no relationship. No. And so when we spoke, I had my... Your acquaintances, shall we call them? Yes, yeah. and my group, my our scientific group, yes. you know, who were studying, and yeah. and I knew a great many people here in the spirit life, uh, and conversed with many. But I see now that, well, I or I feel now that these were very limited. If perhaps I, can, it's wrong to say that they weren't relationships at all. But I see now that 
or I feel now a fondness and an affection for many of those people mm. that I didn't have before. before. I mean, it must have been in me. But yeah, just not it, expressed, right? It wasn't experienced mm. or mm. it wasn't even experienced by, by me. you. <laughs> so, of course, there was really no expression of it towards the other person. Yeah. And, yes, yeah, so... And that's something we notice a lot on her too, Mary and I, when we're travelling in particular, you... You know, you're interested in a person, you ask them questions about their life, and yet there's very little interest coming from them in your life or your experiences or anything like that. And this is a very common thing, isn't it, on Earth too, where everyone's sort of almost, they think they're having relationships, but really life is very insular in a yes. lot of ways. Mm. And insular is perhaps a wonderful way to describe the man that I was. Mm, mm. I lived in my mind and mm -hmm. I interacted with the world really in a similar way to the way that I did scientific observations mm. you know, in a clinical sense, really, mm. from mm. what I know now. Mm. And I had no aspiration really to change that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I was comfortable in that. Yeah, I could give illustrations about that that are a bit crude, but we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember some of my conversations with Mary about, you know, wrapping yourself up in like rubber almost, you know what I mean? And, and so, so that, you know, I actually called it a, a, like, a, a, like a human condom, you know, <laughs> where you can't have any real, you can't really touch the person, mm. you can't really interact mm. with them. It's always true. A membrane of some kind, you know. I'm, I'm well aware of latex from gloves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, it's, it's quite similar to that. Yeah. It was quite similar to that. Yeah. Uh, Where every sense is deadened and every mm. interaction is deadened. And while there are, uh, you could say, residual parts of the interaction are do are, are present that are actually connecting to right, way way deeper feelings mm. because of the sort of the the cover we put over it all it, it doesn't really feel very strong you know it's not mm. it's not something that it, it, we're passionately intense about and this is what i feel about relationships when when you have relationships with other people who are connected with god as well but even with other people who aren't mm. but when you have them with other people who are mm. it's like both of you are now in this state of having this interest and desire and passion and you, you know you're having a real relationship now whereas and of course even with the people who aren't yet in a relationship with god you have far more interest in them and desire mm. to know them and desire to know what drives them and so mm. forth than you would otherwise yeah Mm. Mm. Yes, and that that is absolutely the case. Mm. And I was thinking about your analogy of being wrapped in rubber. Mm -hmm. And I think for myself, I mean, that analogy gives me a sense of there being a, a sort of a living beating heart inside in there. there. Yeah. But for myself, my experience was really as if I was in my mind. Mm -hmm. My mind was my fortress mm -hmm. and... It, I almost used it to deaden everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt almost wooden, or I think I said robotic earlier, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, just just almost as if there was nothing happening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah incredible, isn't it? Yeah.